Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Doug Sosnick, veteran political analyst and strategist, uh, had very senior roles in uh, the Clinton White House, political director and senior advisor to the president for, I think, six Six years. I'm sure they flew right by, Doug. And, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, no chat, no challenges, no tension, you know, no, no, no issues with impeachment or anything. And uh, but Doug was a key strategist in the, in the kind of Clinton Democratic world before that chief of staff to Senator Chris Dodd. So he'll experience as well uh, major uh, private sector clients over the last couple of decades, including the NBA. And I as uh, Jokic deserves all of his all of his fame and uh, everything. All, all all the publicity he's gotten is due to you, right, Doug? <laughs> Whatever you say, Bill. Is Jokic as nice a guy as he's in person as he seems and and sort of uh, in public? I, I haven't met him, but I, I'm told by my colleagues who work there that he is pretty much what you see is what you get. It's a, it's fantastic. I think anyway. So Doug um, uh, has thought a lot about and written a lot about political realignment. Um, and in fact, a recent memo of his really caught my attention, the road to a political realignment in, in, in American politics. I just, I was struck by this was something I was interested in back many decades ago when I studied a little political science and Walter Dean Burnham wrote about realigning elections. And, and I think your argument, Doug, is that there really is a realignment. So anyway, first, thanks for Thanks for joining me today. And I, I think people will learn a lot from this as a sort of analytical, um, political science, but not in a political science-y way, uh, a study of, of what's going on in American politics. So Doug, thanks for thanks for joining me. Great, thank you. It's great to be here. So is, I mean, people have talked about realignments and uh, what, what is the realignment? What, why is, and why is this, why isn't it just, oh, a few things have changed, but come on, it's the same system you and I grew up in, whatever, 40 years ago. So walk us through a little bit what that realignment really is. Well, I think there is a once in a, not even generation, but once in a lifetime realignment in American politics. And it's something for Bill and I, who are probably older than almost everyone on this call, um, we've had to kind of relearn what's going on in American politics, because we, I think, had a pretty good handle on what politics was like in the past. Uh, but it's not necessarily a good guide to what's going on now or where we're headed in the future. And I, I would say that um, that this realignment started uh, probably uh, a little over half a century ago, and I can walk through the reasons and the timing. But if I could distill it down into one simple sentence, uh, unlike when Bill and I grew up in politics where the, there was a saying that was sort of the North Star, which is all politics is local, I think now – all politics is national. And how you vote for president is the same as how you vote for Congress, is the same as how you vote for mayors, how you vote for state legislature. And so that is really turning on its side uh, how politics in our country is oriented. Yeah, that's interesting. So people talk generally about polarization, but this is really the political, the the, the electoral side, you might say, of of the broader sorting and polarization that's gone on. That's right. It's just the data is unambiguous about this. Uh, 45 out of 50 states voted for the same presidential candidate in 2016 and 2020. 95 out of 100 senators are of the same party as the presidential candidate who carried their state in the last election. Uh, Bill and I have discussed in the past, as recently as the 1980s, over half the senators were of a different party than the candidate who carried their state in the last presidential election. There are 23, only 23 members of the House that are of a different party than the presidential candidate who carried their district in 2022. There are 39 states now where one political party controls the governorship and the state legislatures. Over half the state legislatures in the country now uh, are veto-proof uh, and can almost unilaterally pass anything that they want to pass at the state and local level. So I think that these numbers uh, show um, how we have now sorted politically in our country. No, it's remarkable. And I, the, the fact I use, which I, I, I haven't double-checked, but I think is correct. It's very close to being correct. When I came to Washington in 1985, more than half the states had one senator from each party. I think 26 states had one senator from each party. And then presumably of the remaining 24, there was like a 14-12 split. So whichever, you know, the the other party controlled the, the Senate by a couple of seats, a few seats. Um, well, and now, just to, to, to that point, Bill, as recently as the early 2000s, you had two Democratic senators representing North Dakota. 
You had two Democratic senators representing South Dakota, and you had two Democratic senators representing Nebraska. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And but a but a state where the control where the senator representation goes back and forth, which would have been the case there, since there had been Republican senators in those states before and would be after, or a state where there's one senator from each party, Moynihan and Tomato in New York, and Warner and Rob in Virginia, and and, and take just the places I lived before coming here. Um, that's a very different politics from a state that's got two Democratic senators, a Democratic governor, always votes Democratic for president, Democratic House delegation, Democratic state legislature, or the opposite, obviously, with Republican. And I guess the core point here is just empirically that we now are in a in a world where most, the large majority, right, of states are much more in the president, governor, Senate, House, state legislature, all on one side and not really problematic even in that respect. There can be an upset, of course, mansion in West Virginia kind of thing. Um, wait, wait, to finish my point, 26 states then, five states now have senators, have one senator from each party. 26, to, that's a very different politics in, in in terms of policy, in terms of elections, in terms of the country, isn't it? Then I just think people have not come to grips with just that f- fundamental change. Well, that's right. And I think, look, you can say what you want about elected officials, uh, but one thing that they do understand uh, is self-preservation. And we currently have a political system that rewards what I call bad behavior. So for the overwhelming majority of elected officials, uh, they're much more vulnerable to losing a primary than they are a general election based on the sorting around the country. So as a result of that, uh, uh, the, their, their incentives as they think about policy decisions and whether they're willing to cross lines, the incentive structure in our country uh, is set up right now for, for, for both the left and the right to, for members to take the extreme positions in order to avoid losing a primary. Yeah, and the other side of that that I think is less commented on so does in the primaries is just they live in a world where the, it's an echo chamber and not a not a competitive world. Maybe that's not the best way to put it. But, you know, it's it's also just there. Everyone they talk to is on the same side. All the, it's not, even if they don't have a primary challenge, it's just kind of everything reinforces as opposed to what would the alternative be, moderating or checking. Don't you, don't you find that? I mean, you've known so many politicians over the years. Very different world where Bill Clinton has to function in Arkansas, right? Than when Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi are from New York and uh, the Republicans are from, you know, Texas and Florida and so forth. Well, that's right. There, there, there are a variety of reasons for this, including technology. Uh, but, but, but the bottom line is people are, are self-selecting where they live, who they associate with. And increasingly in our evenly and narrowly, narrowly and evenly and profoundly divided country, people are, are largely now self-selecting to be around people just like themselves. So it does have that reinforcing kind of mechanism, an echo chamber, uh, where I can remember in 2016, uh, where I was quite surprised that Trump won. We can talk about 2020, where I was less surprised by how well he did. Uh, but I only had a handful of people I knew who were voting for Trump. So all my data points uh, reinforce my preconceived notion of how the election was going to come out. So I want to come back in a way to the evenly divided side of it and the so few competitive states and what all the implications of that are and the suburbs, as uh, you point this out in the memo, as seemingly the, the swing. But um, educational achievement or attainment, you you point out in the memo, is crucial, that it's become a huge, the diploma divide, I think is the term, I don't know if you coined or you use. And uh, say, say talk about that a little, because we now, again, I think people, it's happened sort of gradually though maybe a little more suddenly in the last couple of election cycles. But talk about that that history and, and where we are on that. Yeah, this will take me just a moment. But uh, just remember that politics is a lagging indicator of what's going on in America. It is sort of the last place that you will see what has actually been happening. And so to me, uh, and it's really hard uh, when you're living in the middle of this unbelievable period of change in our country, it's hard to believe you're actually seeing uh, how big it is because you're just living it. Uh, but just taking a step back, I believe that we're going through the biggest change in our society since the late 1800s when we're transitioning from an agrarian society to an industrial society. 
That transition takes around 30 or 40 years. There are a lot of people in that process that get left behind. Uh, and I believe that we are transitioning from a 20, I don't believe, I think it's quite clear. We have transitioned now from a 20th century top-down uh, manufacturing economy to a 21st century digital global uh, world. And just as you saw the farmers who got left behind in the late 1800s, um, there are a group of people, particularly people who didn't go to college, uh, who were left behind. Uh, as we made this transition. Now, this has been a 50-year transition. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, I believe it all started uh, with the uh, Vietnam War and, and not in the way that most people talk about the Vietnam War. I think the Vietnam War was the beginning of this up, this revolt in America against people with money and power. The Vietnam War was the first war we ever fought as a country where we were not all in this together. And people with money and power could game the system. So I think that was the seeds for the anger that people feel towards people in power in this country. They think the system is rigged. Then you began in the early 1970s, the, the, the actual beginning of the decline of manufacturing in America. Uh, and then that was uh, accelerated. And I'm not sure Bill will agree with all I'm getting ready to say about economics. Uh, but I believe, obviously speaking as a Democrat, uh, and, and from the Milton Friedman School and Professor Jensen from Harvard, uh, where they were promoting a stakeholder, uh, a shareholder economy, capitalism, where everything was driven around the value of the stock. And then you began in the 80s, not only shareholder capitalism, where the worker is no longer valued, um, but offshoring, uh, where you're incentivized to cut costs and the gap between uh, there, there were four lines. Um, uh, that used to go in tandem. It was GDP growth, worker productivity, employment, and wages. And starting uh, uh, McAtee's, uh, uh, Andy McAfee, who's a MIT uh, professor, talked about the delinking in the 70s, where for the first time, there's an old saying, what was good for General Motors was good for America. The more cars General Motors sold, General Motors sold the more people got jobs, the more made they money. Well, the delinking that started in the 70s was as GDP growth went up and as productivity went up, wages and employment became flat. So you then had this trend now of the hollowing out of the middle class. And the people who were the hardest hit were people who had uh, good jobs uh, and did not have a college degree. And so you began this extended period of economic decline in this country for the middle class that, as I mentioned, started in the 70s, uh, accelerated in the 80s. Uh, and then you really saw, as it continued now with China and globalization in the 90s and beginning of the last century, this century, uh, and then the 2008 economic crisis, um, which really came down hardest on these people who had been the hardest hit. And so you've had this long decline of the middle class uh, and people who resent the fact that that at the same time they've been declining, uh, people at the top uh, have never had it better uh, and have been the big the big winners in all of this. So this has created a very toxic political environment. And it's by the way, it's from the left and the right uh, that resent this that's going on. And so just fast forwarding politically quickly, as I mentioned before, politics is a lagging indicator. Uh, I think the 1992 presidential election was the first time this showed up uh, in politics. And that it began with Pat Buchanan's um, speech at the Republican convention, which I'm sure, Bill, you remember. Well, and the primary uh, and then, challenge before yeah, that to, to Bush, yes. actually. Yeah, we yes. got a surprising number of votes in New Hampshire on this, yes. precisely what you're talking about on that platform. Yes. Yeah. And then in the general election, Ross Perot got almost 20 million votes and 19% of the vote. Uh, and then as you move into the 2000s with the, put, the Bush presidency, which I think there was tr from these people who've been the hardest hit economically, I think they were, you know, very much against the war and, and they're the ones who fought the war and they're the ones who, um, you know, we saw the squandered surpluses that were wasted tax cuts for the rich, tax cuts for corporations. The Republicans in the early part of this century, controlling Congress in the, in the White House were much bigger spenders than Democrats everywhere. And this created enormous additional resentment 
within the Republican Party towards the powers that be. So just the, so this in, in Palin's, uh, you know, vice presidential uh, nomination in 2008, the um, Tea Party movement in 2009 and 10, this, this, this is the takeover of the Republican Party by the anti-Rockefeller establishment wing. And the last thing I'll say, which I think is critical to understand American politics today, Donald Trump did not create what's going on in our country. He just accelerated through his 2016 campaign and his presidency, these trends that had been forming long before he entered the fray. And I just, there's one vital statistic, I think, which tells you how it transcends partisanship from before. There were two, 206 counties in the country that voted for Obama in 2008 and Obama in 2012, who voted for Trump in 2016. And those were all disproportionately l- lower educated, uh, lower income. Uh, and, and in 2020, when Biden uh, beat Trump, he only carried 25 of those counties. When Biden got elected in 2020, Trump carried 84 percent of the counties in this country. And so Biden, who, who, who won the election uh, overwhelmingly by the popular vote, over seven million more, um, he, he only carried 16 percent of the counties. But of those 16 percent of the counties that he carried, over 70 percent of the GDP growth in our country were in those Biden counties that he won. And the, and the, and the, the link between those counties and the understanding who lived there is the fact that those were the counties that overwhelmingly disproportionately had higher educated people living there. Yeah, no, and remember, you really, let's just talk about the education thing a little bit. It is striking, when you, and I think what's very interesting in your memo and what you just said is the focus on 92 as a key inflection point, which feels right to me because the Buchanan Perot thing was such a, uh, kind of came out of nowhere. Perot got 19% of the vote, almost 20 million votes, I think. I mean, and Perot was a pretty wacky candidate, and there's not been much stomach for third party or independent candidates in America. There hadn't been at that point for, what, a century, really? I mean, Wallace, a regional candidate, but not that kind of Perot, broad, populist reaction. Um, and But, you know, before that, in 88, George H.W. Bush carries, if I'm not mistaken, New Jersey and California, among other states. He carries upscale suburbs. That's the Republican world. Um, uh, and then that really begins to change dramatically in 92. So talk a little bit about the educational, the way in which education starts to just break open to transform, really, I think what I would say, uh, what, what had been the system we were kind of used to from really from Roosevelt through probably through H.W. Bush or through Reagan, I guess. Right. So when I was trying to figure out how to explain what was going on in American politics, uh, at first I started talking, I was thinking, well, maybe it's class. And then maybe I was, but that didn't quite work. And then it was like, well, maybe it's just people with money. Uh, but you take a Mike Lindell, who I don't know now, but at least in the past, he's had a lot of money. <laughs> so you can't, you couldn't explain it by money. So what I, what really came down to me was education, but it's bigger than education because education is a proxy, I think, for something that's much larger. Uh, but if you look at any of the statistics of the gap between CEO pay and workers on the line pay and people who are ma- at the top and how much they're making, as I mentioned earlier, that gap really kind of exploded between the beginning of the 1970s and, and up until really this day. And then if you look at the sort of the, the through line, the thread of how do you explain the differences between the winners and the losers, it comes back to education. Uh, and so basically, if you tell me uh, uh, the education profile of a district or a city or a state, I can tell you how they're going to vote. Now, it's not 100% right, but it's about 85 or 90% right. And whereas in the past, uh, race was a good indicator uh, and other indices, it, it, it is education. But education, as I say, it, it, it's bigger than just education. It's a proxy for kind of the, your view of the world, how you culturally view things. Um, you know, in a sense, if you're educated and built for uh, today's economy, let me just mention one thing to show you how it's changed. Up until around 20 years ago, all the way through the history of our country, 
people moved to where jobs were. But in the last couple of decades, companies are now moving to places where they have employees that they want to hire. That's a profound change in terms of the relationship between workers and employees. And so if you're a winner in this, you know, well, they, they call it a, um, a hinge moment in history. If you think about a hinge, uh, it's a piece of metal that holds two pieces of wood together. And the Professor Dyson from Princeton talks about hinge moments in history where the hinge is transitioning from one era to another. And we, as I say, I think are in a hinge moment that's that we haven't seen since the late 1800s. So in this new hinge moment era, if you're the right kind of worker with the right kind of education and background, your opportunity has never been greater in the history of our country. And if you're on the other side of this hinge moment, where you don't have the skills and don't have the education for this new society, your your chances of of of, of upward mobility has never been worse. In fact, we're, we're, Europe is more, is, is, you're more likely with upward mobility now in Europe than the United States. Can you imagine such a thing? Right, no, that's um, not, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's why, you know, the, the way I, way I uh, put the fault line is half the country thinks the country's not changing fast enough for the moment. And the other half of the country thinks we're changing too fast. Right. Uh, and so everything is colored about whether or not you feel like you have a wind to your back in terms of opportunity or a wind to your face. And so that's why you have this education fault line, because that's the, the best through line and thread to predict whether or not you, you're going to be a winner or a loser in this new economic system. Now, it will change. And we can, if we have time, you're interested, we can talk about it. I do think we're going to come out of this. But it's going to, as we transition from the agrarian society to an industrial society, that takes decades before it moves all the way down uh, to benefit more people. I mean, the only thing I'd add, and I don't think you'd agree, disagree with this at all, you, you alluded to it, in addition to sort of just pure, let's say, economic opportunity, so much of it is also values and 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 comfort, comfort with a multicultural society and with, you know, uh, multiracial society and so forth and and diversity as they as, as the, it's not an accident that terms become so big right on the one hand and uh wokeness and identity politics so so much a term of hostility on the other i, I do think it's a it's an economic divide and a sociological and cultural divide and but it is new i mean i guess that's what i come back to just to sort of put put a put, put a pin on that one point you couldn't look at america politically in the 70s or 80s and sort of do what you've just said which is sort out demographically by educational achievement and really even more if you start going to have postgraduate degrees and so forth and say that's democratic that's republican if anything it was slightly the opposite way but it was more mixed basically and 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 that's why you have a very different politics uh when there are so many competitive states with mixed up coalitions so to speak as opposed to this national sorting i i, I myself always thought the all politics is local thing was wrong but that's because i came to washington late enough frankly that by the time I really got involved, you know, after I worked a few years in the in the education department where I wasn't really in politics, it was already obvious. To, the one thing I did see, I didn't see all this stuff that you lay out in the memo so well. I didn't see all that very clearly. But I but I did see that it's just not correct anymore. People in, you know, ed, well-educated suburbs or in college towns uh, have more in common with each other, whether they're wherever they are in the country. And, 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 and people in... Uh, areas that have lost jobs or rural areas have more in common with each with each other, and that's why they're the red dots in blue states and the blue dots in red states is also a very important phenomenon. Don't you think? I mean, that you know the, the 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 districts in New York that went Republican, surprising people in twenty twenty, but especially in twenty two, those look like Central Pennsylvania districts demographically and sociologically, and they were sort of lagging because New York was more liberal in general, and so people didn't quite make the move as early as they did and. <laughs> Kentucky or Pennsylvania or something, but I, I feel like the just that 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 insight about the sorting, which people sort of have a sense of, you really bring it home in that memo. But so, I mean, just on the education side, just to final finish that point, I mean, yeah, the degree to which it's now the Democratic states are better educated, and Democratic districts are better educated, and Republican states and districts less college education, and that's pretty 
not quite uniform, but pretty close, right? And, and it's accelerated the change from 92 to 2000 to 2008 to, to 2016. Trump really does seem to put a big, a lot of gas into that in 2016, accelerating kind of what was happening already, right? Yeah, and I think just a couple of quick points from you. First of all, to the extent back in the 80s and 70s, it started in the late 60s, uh, and certainly was the case in the 70s and 80s, to the extent that you could look at voting in America and try to find the one sort of cleavage where it was clear uh, was race. Yeah. And outside of race, uh, there, weren't, there weren't the cuts of partisanship, like you mentioned, between women and men and, and, and education levels and even by income is the first thing. Secondly, um, it, it, you're right about the fact that in the 80s, uh, you could see what was coming. And so you take a guy like Joe Manchin, um, in a sense, the people who are defying the laws of political gravity are essentially grandfathered. But once they leave, gravity will take its course. So you had a much of a white, moderate, conservative Southern Democrats uh, who were longtime incumbents in the House in the 80s and early 90s who were going to stay there as long as they chose to. But once they left, uh, it was inevitable that the laws of political gravity are going to resettle, and those are all going to become Republican districts. Uh, the third thing is um, there, there are 46 congressional districts right now that the Cook Report considers competitive. Um, only three of them are in rural areas. None of them in urban areas. So they're all in suburban areas. Now, suburban areas could be, you know, if you think about whatever community you're in as you're, as you're watching the Zoom, I mean, it's true across the country that the, the more densely populated a suburb is and generally probably closer to a city, the more likely they are to be democratic. And the less densely populated and probably more closer to rural than an area is, the more likely they are to be Republican. But these are the areas of the battlegrounds in American politics. It's not rural areas and it's not urban areas. And the last thing I'll say, which is I think of particular danger to Democrats, uh, is the Democratic Party is becoming a party of the educated uh, and and blacks, uh, to some extent minorities, but that's changing with more Hispanics and Asians, I think, voting uh, based on, on uh, educational levels uh, for Republicans. But, you know, one of the problems that uh, Democrats have in getting voters in the country, and it's just like the language that Democrats use, like flyover parts of the country, which is a pejorative term. And, and we as Democrats will never get the voters in these areas uh, if they think we're looking down on them, if, we, if they think we're looking down on their choices of entertainment, if they're looking down. Uh, like, frankly, you've got to figure out, Democrats have to figure out the fact, you know, 75 million people that voted for Trump. I mean, they're not all idiots. They're not all morons. Um, if you want to treat them as idiots and treat them as morons, there's a pretty good chance they'll never get their vote. Now, there are a lot of really sketchy people who voted for Trump, and they're ungettable, and Democrats have no shot and shouldn't, shouldn't try to. But, there, but this education, being captive to a party driven by the educated elites is a very dangerous thing for the Democratic Party going forward if we want to be a majority party. Yeah, and Joe Biden looks less like that kind of Democrat. And it was very fortunate, in my point of view, that he won the nomination in 2020. And it wasn't obvious that that was going to happen, right? Right. Well, I think there was, you know, you have uh, in primaries, you have what, you know, referred to as a chemical reaction. It happens at some point. You can't predict it, but it happens and it's there. And the chemical reaction in 2020 was the fact that it was either going to be Bernie Sanders as a Democratic nominee or someone else. And the party quickly coalesced behind Biden as the someone else. And by the way, you know, if you look at all the mistakes that Trump did as president, all the crazy things he said, all the crazy things he did, he almost won the election. I know. It is, and if you yeah. go back and look at who else could have been the nominee other than Biden, it's hard for me to see that anyone else other than Biden would have won in 2020. Yeah, that's that's important, I think. Um on the just maybe just one final final point on the kind of just the analytical side and before we get to each party and and, and the even balance and swing states and all which is sort of the implication of what you've been 
laying out the non the, the total collapse of split ticket voting i mean again if you're our age you sort of remember that era right by definition if democrats control the house and reagan wins 49 states there's a heck of a lot of split ticket voting going on and if and that was true into 88 and 92 as you say even in the 2000s with these democratic senators from republicans presidential states that is really collapse at the state level, but also at the House district level. How many there are 23 districts or something like that that were that went against the voted for a member of Congress in 2020 against their presidential candidate? 20, 23 or whatever the right number is, is is five percent of the congressional districts. That's that is just a country that's lined up in a in a sort of parliamentary way, you might say, but down to the state level and the House and the state representative level. And I mean it's good or it's bad. It, I think it's mostly not great for the country for obvious reasons, but uh, but it's no one chose it, and, and it can't. Incidentally, I do, don't you think a lot of the people redistricting and all these things, that's that is a problem. And obviously, you get I mean gerrymandered. You get uh, you get gerry, more gerrymandering when you have a already the polarization makes it it's sort of self reinforcing. But I feel like people overdo the kind of gerrymandering side of it when they talk about it, and not just that this is where the country has kind of landed, you know, uh, socioeconomically here. Well, I think I'd say a couple of things. First of all, uh, we will get out of this, although I think it's going to take well into this decade. Um, but we've got to change the reward system so that the politicians will change. And part of that is how we, you know, gerrymandering and, uh, you know, rank choice voting and right. uh, a variety of things that, that encourage. And you're seeing it happening at the state level uh, now. Um so I think that, you know, changing the reward system uh, is going to be ultimately, well, that and the fact, if uh, just to finish this thought. So to me, we can get out of this. Uh, we will not get out of this probably in this decade. Um, eight out of the nine, eight out of the last nine elections, they voted, the country voted out either, either a president uh, or control of the House or control of the Senate. So we're currently in a, in a, Period where not, the people aren't voting for someone, they're motivated more by voting against someone. And that's part of what uh, I think was Biden's appeal in 20, and I think what part of the strategy in the White House today uh, is to really try to stay out of the way and make it a referendum on Trump. Uh, and just to finish the point about ticket splitting, um, and this should be a, a blinking red light for Republicans, um, there was, there were in fact, significant, or I wouldn't say, I would call it meaningful ticket splitting in 2022. And those were Republicans in, in governor's races and in Senate races voting Democratic. Now, in governor's races, they were double digit. Uh, and in Senate races, they were depending on the state between six and eight or 10%. Now, that's not like days in the past but if you're dealing with razor thin major, uh, differences, uh, and if you have 25% of Republicans or 30% of Republicans uh, who are, are never Trumpers, um, they can be very significant in the outcome of these states that have been closed. And I just don't take my word for it. Uh, after the Republicans failed for the second cycle in a row to take the Senate back, um, the first thing Mitch McConnell said, uh, the uh, first thing he said was we lost because we had terrible candidates. But the second thing he said was uh, Republican defections were one of the main reasons Republicans lost, didn't take control of the Senate. So I think there uh, there is a group of, sw of, of ticket splitters um, that I think could probably increase based on how the Republican primary plays out um, that really could make the difference. Um, in the general, particularly if there's not a, se a serious third party option. Yeah, I mean, this is where, you know, if you're, if you're an election denying Republican who also is a little crazy and conspiratorial and stuff, you can drive your Republican vote down to 45 or 43 or something like that, and you can get pretty badly uh, clobbered in, in Michigan and Pennsylvania. And it needs, uh, you know, with some of us did a fair amount of work to try to get people to know how crazy these Republicans were. On the other hand, in Arizona, Carrie Lake was all of that and got within. 0.5 percent, I think, half a percentage point of winning. So the partisanship and polarization remain strong enough to overcome some of that. But I agree, not on the margin, it makes a huge difference. But so talk about that. There, how many swings to? I mean, so here we are we're in this polarized country. Uh, education, a very good 
when you map the states, you do this in the memo, education, with one or two exceptions, really, is a very good predictor of where the states are in terms of the polarization. But there are a bunch in the middle, both in terms of education and in terms of actual vote performance in the last few cycles, the Pennsylvanias and Michigans, Wisconsin's, uh, I guess, Georgia, Arizona. They're all actually strikingly, they're a little different from each other, but they're all sort of in that in the middle in terms of educational uh, achievement and, and, in the, and are the swing states. So that doesn't change in the very near future, does it? We have eight swing states and that's that. And they're fought bitterly and they're single digit percentage, maybe 10% at most swing voters in them. Is that about right? That, that That's, well, that's probably a little bit more on swing voters, but yes, that's right. And, you know, and so there was a popular saying amongst Democrats in the early part of the century, which was um, demography is destiny. So under that theory, uh, as, as young people, non-whites, uh, uh, became a bigger and bigger percentage of politics in America, there was an inevitability that all the Sun Belt was going to move to the Democrats. Uh, and it hadn't quite played out that way uh, because, uh, as I think education's part of it, uh, but, you know, you've seen in the last couple cycles that Republicans have done particularly well, Hispanic voters in, across the country, but particularly in Florida and Texas. So whereas 15 years ago, someone would tell you that it's inevitable that Florida and Texas will become Democratic, uh, I don't know that, I think Texas could, in a few decades from now, maybe become Democratic, but uh, Republicans, if anything, are getting stronger in Florida. Um, but, but I think we're really down, if you're generous, to eight states that are competitive. And, and four of them are in the kind of 20th century manufacturing industrial belt, and four of them are in the Sun Belt. So you have Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and New Hampshire, which uh, are much disproportionately higher percentage of people who live there are white, older, uh, and with the exception of New Hampshire, um, are kind of in the middle of that education level. And then you have North Carolina, uh, uh, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada that are trending more democratic, uh, but they're really... It, at really at best 50-50 in North Carolina is probably not even 50-50. Uh, and that's really where the battleground is. And so the, a, absent of uh, Nevada, which is lower on education, and Hampshire, which is higher on education. And by the way, most people will tell you for the 2024 election that I'm that, that eight states is a too generous analysis. And most people it's down think it's down to three or four states. But six of those eight states, the education levels are dead square in the middle uh, of the country. And so I think the, the sort of formula, and these are all razor thin outcomes in these states, both in the presidential elections in the last two cycles, as well as the statewide races, particularly for Senate in, uh, in the last couple of cycles. So the secret in these um, uh, states is going to be twofold. One is, is to create, is to b build as much turnout as you can uh, amongst your base voters based on education. So and that's one of the se secrets to Trump's success uh, in 2020 uh, was his ability to grow the turnout of less educated people in the industrial Midwest states in particular who hadn't voted in 2016. And so if I can interrupt, and in 2016, this is in your memo, I mean, I remember 2013, 14, it was sort of, well, Republicans are probably maxed out with the non, the white working class. I mean, they, Romney was, who was not naturally a great candidate for them, maybe he was still, but Obama was not a great candidate on the other side. They won by, uh, I think, 18 points uh, among white working class voters. And that's like a huge margin. Trump doubled that to 36. I mean, and I, that's why I'm, I, as, as someone who, you know, I'm for Biden next time, if he's, if it's him again, or Trump, that's for sure. I mean, they keep things saying that, well, Trump's kind of, you can't, get even more of those white working class voters to either vote or to switch. But I don't know that there's there's more growth there than Democrats should be comfortable with, don't you think? There is, but I think you have to look at it twofold. One is turnout, and then the other is how they vote. Yeah. Uh, they, they, Biden marginally improved his performance in 2020 compared to Clinton in 16 on how they voted. But the big difference was Trump's ability to increase the turnout. Yeah. Uh, amongst these people who hadn't voted in 2016. Um, so the formula for Republicans uh, uh, and Democrats, depending on the state, is is how do you maximize this diploma divide where for Trump, it's getting less educated voters to turn out and for Democrats, it's getting more educated to turn out. But the other part of that is in these because these states are so narrowly divided by election results, 
uh, you can't ignore these swing voters. And, and, you know, we had the highest percentage of people who turned out in 2022 who self-described themselves as independents, political independents. I think it's the highest level since 1980. 40% of the people in Arizona who voted in 2022 called themselves political independents. So I think you've got to have in in these states that matter, uh, you have to have a two-track approach here. One is to maximize the uh, diploma divide based on where you are, but the other is you can't ignore these swing voters. Now, uh, and, 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 and Catalyst did a, an analysis, which is a Democratic data firm of, of the 2022 midterms, and they showed in their analysis how different non-competitive states and districts were in voting than this handful of places that are competitive. And that 17 million fewer people voted in the 2022 midterms compared to the 2018 midterms, which was a historic high. Uh, But in the competitive states, statewide, the turnout was actually higher than 2018. And and so when you're looking at- 2022. 2022. So when you're looking at uh, what's going to happen in 2024, don't look at the national polling. Biden beat Trump by over 7 million votes. Biden's margins in, in, in California and New York was greater than his margin of victory nationally. So, so the national polls skew what's going on because you've got the extremes weighing in, but they have nothing to do, or not nothing to do, but they're not determinative of the outcome because it's, it's down to these handful of states. That's all that matters. The 2016 polling nationally was accurate. It predicted Clinton's popular vote victory. What wasn't accurate, what was going on in the states. And that's the only place that matters. Well, these eight states at most. It is striking. I mean, the turnout thing, which can be ridiculed easily, you know, every... Uh, political pros asked who's going to win. Oh, it depends on turnout. And of course, it's kind of ludicrous. It's definitionally, you know, it's, it's like a tautology. But I do find talking to people who haven't been in, in, you know, frankly, in real campaigns, they don't quite focus. And the exit polls are bad this way because they give you percentages of every group's vote. But it, it is worth a lot more in politics. I'll say this in a very stupid and simple way. Just to, It's a lot more to win 60-40 among a million voters turning out in a certain category than to win 63-37 among, I'm just doing the math in my head, 750,000 voters turning out, right? I mean, what matters is the absolute gap that you're building up in the groups that are favorable to you and then minimizing the gap in the groups that are unfavorable to you. That can be done by persuasion. You can switch some of those. You can go from 60-40 to 63-37 or, you know, yeah, on either side, you can go from 37 to 40 or you can go from 60 to 63. That's important. But you also can just, if you can get more people to vote in those in those groups, it's so crucial. And, and uh, that I think is so, yeah, and that is partly a mobilization thing, but also partly a persuasion thing. And I'm curious on the education thing, just as a sidebar, but so young voters are more democratic and therefore young turnout, youthful turnout is big, but young voters also split on education, no? I mean, it's not as if every young voter turning out is not necessarily good for the Democrats and same as you've been saying with minorities as well. That's right. Well, it's, you know, it's, let me talk broadly and then let me talk more narrowly to young people. So broadly, uh, there was a poll that came out in Gallup recently, which shows a, uh, increasing conservatism in America on social issues, a significant increase in the sort of anti-woke view uh, amongst Americans. Uh, However, I think with young people, uh, it's really a gating issue. Uh, uh, And particularly, I think uh, abortion is is that for a lot of people. Uh, Even if, and make no mistake about it, young people do not, identify with Democrats. They identify our political system and our parties as broken, just like everything else in our country. They, the Z's and millennials grew up with a belief in, in institutions are either one of two things. They're either broken or they're corrupt. And they have no faith or confidence in anybody in power in this country because for their entire life, all they remember is how these systems have failed them. So the young people are not aligned for the Democratic Party. 
they are aligned against the Republican Party. And that's largely driven by social issues. And and if the issue of abortion for a lot of people, and, and remember that the party is being the Republican Party is being pulled further and further to the right. Gallup came out with a poll today. The highest percent of people in the history of polling, 69% believe that abortion should be legal for the first three months. 69% now, the highest on record. So as you see these states, 26 of them, I think, are controlled by Republicans. And there's a race in a lot of these states to see who can be toughest on the issue of abortion. Um, for those young people living there, uh, it's going to be easy on how they're going to vote. The, the young turnout was, was higher, significantly higher in 2022 midterms than the 2018 midterms. You had three states, three bright red Republican states in 2022, West Virginia, Kansas, and Montana, that voted down referendums on abortion that would have limited access. So that's what's driving this young the young voting is the extreme social positions. And it's not just that you're going to see some rulings this week or next week from the court uh, on LG, LBTGT issues and other issues. So that's a gating issue for a lot of young people. The last thing I'll say is, and I tend to oversimplify, and what I'm getting ready to say is not something that a lot of Democrats agree with. Um, but I, I kind of think about 40% of the country is crazy left and 40% are crazy right and 20% are what I call civilians who think that both sides are crazy. And and they disproportionately live in the suburbs, by the way. Um, and those are the people that are voting against whoever's in power. They're not voting for, for anybody. And I think, so the tale of the tape, getting back to what I alluded to earlier, to be successful in this politics is you have to have a two-track strategy. You have to you have to get your 40%, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you got to get your 40% crazy to turn out. You're not worried about how they're going to vote. You just got to make sure they turn out. Uh, but you can't ignore in these states that, that determine political power in our country, you can't ignore the 20% that think that both sides are crazy. And so the, 22, the 2022 election, and, and I'm speaking now um, as a Democrat, obviously, I, I thought it was, and I didn't think it was going to be a very important election. And I said the day after we're going to move on and no one's going to ever know what, it happened. I think I was wrong about that. I, I thought that was the most positive election we've had probably since the beginning of the century. It it reaffirmed, reaffirmed my confidence in the American public. In the states that mattered, across the board, they voted against crazy. Not a single election denier won a statewide election in the eight states that matter. Now, understand that as they were voting for Democrats, um, a lot of them don't like Biden, think he's doing a terrible job. And 70 percent of them thought that the country's headed in the wrong direction. But they were looking for less crazy and more normalcy. And, and I think that was a powerful statement. And I think that's going to be the backdrop uh, for the 2024 election. And I think that there are tremendous, I mean, if you look at, and what, so, so Bill and I grew up where it was pretty simple when you have presidents running for the election. Just tell me two things at the beginning of the election year. What's your job approval and what's the right track, wrong track? It's all you need to know. Well, that doesn't matter anymore. And Biden is in the low 40s right now on his job approval. He's got 70 percent of the country that thinks we're headed in the wrong direction. Um, but that's not what's going to determine the outcome. What's going to determine the outcome is going to be who's less crazy. And, and there's tremendous trepidation that people have about Biden. They have the, you know, trepidation about the job he's done. They have obviously real concerns that I think only increased about his age. They have real concerns, which I think have only increased about Harris as the VP. So, we're back to, you know, eight out, as I mentioned earlier, eight out of the nine of the last elections of cut, the voters have voted for some form of change. And to the extent that the last election was not a change election, uh, although, you know, the Republicans to take the House back, um, it's, I think it's, it's now about who's less crazy. Uh, and that's really much more, I think, uh, going to be the, the tail of the tape than, than Biden's job approval, right track, wrong track. Or what? Uh, and under, remember now, in these eighty, these eight states represent only nineteen percent of the U.S. population. So eighty-one percent of the United States, eighty-one percent of the population of the United States, 
how they vote, whether they vote, will have no impact on who's going to be the next president of the United States. It's amazing. So let's get to, well, you brought us very well to, uh, to 2024. So let me just pepper you with a few questions about that, both both sort of predictive and also then what advice you'd give to either party. Uh, you can you can make yourself give advice to Republicans in some theoretical world. So uh, are we looking at a Biden-Trump race? Do you think that's a, almost a done deal, you know, absent medical uh, events, obviously? Well, I'll tell you just a quick family story. So last year, I wrote an op-ed that the Times was willing to wanted to run. And the op-ed said that I didn't believe in the general election in 2024. I didn't believe Biden would be on the ticket. I didn't believe Harris would be on the ticket. I didn't believe Trump would be on the ticket. And I didn't believe Pence would be on the ticket. Well, ultimately, my family persuaded me not to run that op-ed. And, and uh, I, I still actually think that op-ed might be right. But I certainly have less confidence in that outcome now uh, than I did a year ago when I wrote but did not publish that. Uh, and I just have a sense, let me put it differently, there's never been a time in my political life where I've ever seen on paper two front runners that are further in front and seem to be more certain to be the nominee than we have now. And I've also never seen in that period of time more uncertainty about both of them and their ability to get from in mid June of of thirteen to the ballot box in November of fourteen. I've never felt more uncertain about twenty four. Their twenty four. There, I've never felt more uncertain about their viability to get from here to there. No, that's so well said. I've had the exact same reaction, which is analytically, you show me an incumbent president who has no serious challenger. You show me a. The out party with someone who's won the nomination twice, running above fifty percent, and you know those two are highly, highly, highly likely to be the nominees. But my instinct, my gut, the country doesn't want a Biden Trump rematch, and so instinctively, or or whatever the right word is for that, kind of is temperamentally almost, John Sears, whom you knew, Reagan's top strategist, used to have this nice term about appropriateness that somehow the country the nominee is often someone who the country judges is kind of appropriate for the times and uh, he, he used this to say that reagan who many people thought couldn't win in 1980 would win the nomination or the general he thought no there was enough unhappiness with carter and so forth and, and liberal policies that reagan had become appropriate in 80 in a way he hadn't been in 76 and so for clinton in 92 i'd make the same case someone who uh, you know, we thought in the Bush White House, come on, draft dodger, 43-year-old governor of Arkansas against the guy who would help preside over the successful end of the Cold War. But he was appropriate for the post-Cold War era. era. I don't feel either Biden or Trump were exactly appropriate for 2020, 2024, but I also, analytically, it's hard to see, uh, you know, that either won't be the nominee. So I guess, but I don't know. So, well, I would just say two things, just to- Please, yeah since you and I are taking a spin down memory lane, right? Yeah, right. Um, what, what was true in both the, the Clinton 1980 campaign and the Bush 92 campaign was the Reagan fact 80, that if you look, yeah. I'm sorry, Reagan 80, was the, um, if you looked at their vote in January of of their election year, whether it was 80 or 92, uh, or I'd say by June, the, by June, the, the, what their head-to-head vote was in both of those elections was reflected in their vote on election day. So in other words, their vote never changed. The anti-Carter, anti-Bush vote, all it did as you get closer to an election, which it normally does, is consolidate right. against around one person who's not the incumbent. The undecideds broke against Carter yeah. and against right. Bush, which well, was predictable well, in that era. I mean, yeah. Well, or in, in 80, though, you had, um, uh, uh, in particular in 80, you know, you had uh, the anti-Carter vote split between Anderson and, and Reagan right. uh, until the end, and then it all just rolled in. But the second thing, which I think ties back in uh, uh, to you know, kind of the topic here of this uh, discussion is, uh, so you're right about like appropriateness and what the country's looking for. Um, so then how do you explain why we are where we are? Uh, and the answer is, because of the architecture of American politics, the divisions in our country, and, and how we have sorted ourselves out, that is what's driving, uh, at least today, the probable, probable horse race 
or choices next November of 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 seventy percent of the country is saying in Poland they don't want a Biden Trump rematch. So how do you explain why this is where it is? The answer is because of the architecture of our politics is so strong that it that it that it overrides everything, including having two nominees that no one wants. And and I guess one question, and this really is, who knows, right? I mean, is that, that architecture is very strong until the moment it might be just cracks, you know? And so is it possible, it seems unlikely before November 24th, but maybe I've always wondered in the four years after that or something, you could really get a, a big enough change that suddenly, you know, the, this realignment goes in a different direction. But I think, I mean, you've captured so well what this, this this rolling realignment over the last 30, 40 years has been. I mean, let me ask, so let's assume so for I mean, now. So, well, so I could just th- say one thing on that. Yeah. So as you know, Bill, when you give a speech, there are three rules. You have to show up on time. You shouldn't offend the host. And it would be nice to leave people on a positive note. Right. So I have an impeccable record of showing up on time. I have a mixed record on not offending the host. Uh, and I had to really work to try to figure out how to end on a positive note. I finally came up with something that I actually believe in. It, it took me a long time, uh, and I do believe it. And so the question is, is where we are forever? And if it's not, when's it going to change and why is it going to change? And my answer is, it's not going to happen. We're not going to be in this place forever. We're in a transition, as I mentioned several times now. We're going in this hinge moment of history, and we're transitioning from one era to another. And as you saw in the shift to an industrial society, it took several decades before more people felt it. But they do feel it. They do feel the change. And you're seeing how we're changing our system now of qualifications for jobs and not using a you know, a college degree as a proxy and giving people the right cha- training. So that's going to help uh, on that. Um, secondly, um, the country is, it's, I believe, when, I used to, when, when Trump was president and I would go speak in front of a Democratic group, I'd say to him, you know, if you're not happy right now, tough. Because you didn't, nothing, you didn't do anything about it, and Trump won. So at some point, we have as a country right now, the country we deserve, the, the leadership. And unless and until... The people in this country do something about it and stop rewarding this behavior. Um, we're going to have more of this. Now, I believe, though, that uh, that the country will get fed up because they're not aligned with either party. So that's going to happen. The third thing is I allude to it. I'm not going to get into the details is we're changing the reward system where all of a sudden moderate is going to be more important. But the last thing I think most importantly uh, is going to be uh, the demographic changes in our country when the, basically the, the baby boomers die off and are still clinging to the last remnants of power and the millennials and Generation Z voters take over. I'm actually quite optimistic about what our country's going to look like at that point. I think that, that they're much more like the greatest generation. They're much more communitarian. They're not invested in either of these political parties. Uh, people keep saying, well, if 70% of the country worries about climate change and 70% of the country believes we ought to have more gun control and why haven't these things changed? The answer is because the people aren't voting on that. But as you see the dying off generationally of the people who've been hanging on to the old system and this, uh, this emerging generation takes over political power in our country, and they are now the majority by numbers of voting, you're going to see a complete change in our politics. But I think that's more likely to be in the next decade to really feel it than it is in this decade. So now you could say, in a sense, we've had nothing but chaos in American politics since the, 19, since the 2000 election and the Supreme Court ruling on Bush versus Gore. And you could say it's really been nothing but chaos for the last 23 years. And in fact, it's true. Uh, and if you assume we're going to have that sort of chaos for the next, say, into this decade, which it probably will, that's 30 years. Well, if you take the sweep of history, 30 years is really not a long time. Um, so we are in the middle. I think we're closer to the end now than the beginning of this phase. And I am optimistic we're going to come out on the other side. But I still think we're going to be in this period uh, for several more cycles. I hope, we're, I hope we are closer to the end. And I also, you know, of course, a lot of damage can be done in these quote, in between periods, unless it's it's constrained. I mean, the guardrails have to hold somewhat. I mean, my version of this, just to 
30 seconds is, uh, it sounds like our speeches are quite similar and I also try to be on time, but, and I also don't really do a very good job of obeying the, leave us with an upbeat thought, you know, but my version of this is from 60 to 80, when I was, you know, from when I was seven years old, I guess, till, till when I came, you know, got my PhD and all this began teaching, American politics featured no successful two-term presidencies, uh, no full two-term presidencies. Uh, Nixon was the only one who even got reelected. It featured assassinations, it featured riots, it featured a failed war in Vietnam with pretty bad bad consequences here and God knows in Cambodia, horrible consequences in Vietnam itself and so forth. Uh, and people were writing articles in the late 70s, very intelligent observers, political scientists. You know, the, no one can be a successful president. The whole system is totally broken. We need to have a parliamentary system. We gotta get rid of the constitution. I mean, it wasn't crazy to have all those concerns. America's in decline. That was huge, right, with the late 70s. Um, from 80 to 2016, again, whatever one thinks, and there were some many problems in that era, we had basically a 12-year Reagan-Bush presidency and then three eight-year presidencies. Suddenly, everyone's getting reelected. Uh, suddenly, uh, we win the Cold War. Suddenly, we're, you know, it doesn't feel, thank God, there were assassination attempts early on, but then we get beyond that. And and it, and it changed kind of abruptly, actually. Those, those two periods, it wasn't like everyone was sitting around in 1979, 80 saying, okay, we're at the end of this this era of 20 years of, of chaos and so forth. And now we're going to enter, you know, in a way a more uh, placid or success, you could even argue successful political era. That's complicated and cuts both ways. But anyway, these things do change kind of suddenly and unpredictably, I think. When it, so if I, could, if I could unpack, though, I agree with what you said. If I could unpack why... Yeah, you, you, I would just say quickly. So the sixty to eighty period was the transition, a, a demographic transition in our country uh, to the baby boomers taking over. Uh, so that was what caused a fair amount of that. And secondly, if you look to the sweep of history, we had uh, and there's an economics professor named Gordon out of uh, Northwestern who wrote about this. We had unparalleled growth in this country unparalleled growth economically that has never been seen since the beginning of civilization. And so that enables all kinds of things to happen. If you go from the 80, from 1980, and so the, 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 the cultural transition though, from the takeover of the baby boomers from the great, the greatest generation is what really fueled a lot of, of that 60 to 80 period in the turmoil. The, the and 80, civil rights and feminism yes, and so forth. Yeah. Yes. Which is all part of the baby boomers, and the, and then the 1980 to 2016 uh, was uh, you know we had a deal since World War II basically between the parties. I think there are two things that drove here. One, we kind of have a deal. If we got four percent GDP growth, then everybody's we're okay with everybody. You know, and we can like disagree on foreign policy. But the kind of compact we had as a country, political leaders, was basically as long as we have good economic growth, you know, we all have investments in the system. And let's not rock the boat. Now, the other factor, though, is um, is the country doesn't trust either political party. And other than Bush, who essentially ran for a Reagan third term in 88, uh, the country's shown that basically since Roosevelt, they don't want any party to be in power more than eight years. Um, and so I think the decline, the GDP, the GDP growth decline, the unevenness of it, uh, uh, is is uh, what you know stopped? You know, I said that you know McCain was the only person to lose to Bush twice, lost in two thousand, and then there's no way the country was going to vote for a third Bush term in in two thousand eight. And I don't think the country was ready to vote for a third Obama term in twenty sixteen. Um, uh, so I think those are the kind of underlying factors of those tr meta trends that you're talking about. No, that's very that's actually important and interesting. So finally, let's just I mean. Biden calls you in and uh, maybe he has called you in, but uh, I mean, he's by, not, let's assume we are in, you know, the, the world we're in and nothing radical, uh, dramatic changes in terms of the actual people on the ticket uh, or the tickets themselves, I suppose. Um, what, what what can Democrats, but particularly the Biden administration, do to improve their chances in 24? And then what about the Republicans? I mean, what, what advice would you give each party in your in your magic, you know, five minutes with their with their leaders, insofar as they even have leaders these days. Well, if I were in the Biden White House, and I have some familiarity having done this for six years in the Clinton White House, um, so you have to look. You have to look at if you're a staffer, you have to look at who your principal is. You know who they are, who they're not, 
what they're good at, what they're not good at. What's the situation? How do you maximize their strengths and minimize their weaknesses? So for the Biden White House, I would do a lot of what they're doing, a bit more of it. So the first thing is, um, much like Reagan, uh, this is a very controlled White House. Uh, there's very little uh, spontaneity. Uh, everything is scripted. Uh, if you look at uh, Biden's schedule in terms of the number of hours per day that he's working and the number of public events, they're very limited, very much like Reagan's second term. Um, so I would keep a very controlled environment. I would spend a lot more time right now focusing on the quote unquote Harris problem. And what I would do with Harris is, uh, and I believe, by the way, no one's ever, no one says this. I believe when you look at how narrowly Biden won in 2020, you could point to anything and say that made the difference. I believe Harris helped get Biden elected. I think she made a difference. I think her, she held her own on the debate. She created energy out there. She got a better turnout among some of the targeted voters. She was good on the stump. And so I would have Harris full time on the road. I would have her uh, out amongst friendly audiences, uh, both to jazz them up, but to also build her up and give her more self-confidence. Uh, and the way that I would build the White House, and they do it, but I do much more of it, and I have her do a lot of this, is every event where they go, they need to go somewhere at the scene of an accomplishment of the administration where they've made people's lives better. An infrastructure package is probably the best. I would go to that scene. I would have someone introduce Biden and Harris. I would have them talk about the fact we wouldn't be here today except for the, what these people did and how it's going to impact the local community. I would then have Harris or Biden get up there and say, it's really gracious. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I'm here to, today not to talk about what we've accomplished, but I want to talk about the future. And that's how I would drive the entire White House operation, I would I would have the principal stay completely clear of Trump, and, and they're doing this, I might add, um, and I would stay on that. And, and the, you know, so I the analogy I always, I used in the you know the Clinton ninety six reelect, we never announced he was running for reelection um, formally. I mean, I used to say you open the window at two o'clock in the morning in the middle of March and just say I'm running and shut the window and we'll be done with it. Um, and I want him to be president as long as possible and not a candidate. Because when you're president, the country thinks you're working on their problems. When you're a candidate, they think you're trying to keep your job. So I would keep him presidential as long as possible. Uh, and I would have it all built around how people's lives have changed because of what they've done. And I would li I would particularly put Harris in the high growth states of, uh, of the eight states in North Carolina, uh, probably Arizona. Georgia and Nevada, and I would have Biden spending more time in the, the Rust Belt states. Um, and so to me, it's relatively easy. And I take advantage of, I mean, I, you got to figure out how to manage. I mean, Biden, in the last CNN poll, Biden's only getting 60 percent of the Democratic vote in a primary. Forty percent of the vote is either going to Kennedy, Williamson or, or nobody. So that's that's not great. So you got to figure out how to, in the Biden White House you're going to manage uh not having a primary, but also not creating these benchmarks which demonstrate weakness. Um, um, so to me, and maybe it's my background, maybe it's dealing with an incumbent. I uh, also say the, the analogy I always use, and this is what I would use in the Biden White House, is a duck. If you think about a duck, above the water, very placid, and below it, very, very, you know, paddling, frenetic activity. So Biden should be, the White House should be a duck, which is above the water, very calm, very presidential, and, uh, uh, and not political. Beneath the surface should be frenetic activity as partisan and political as possible without getting caught. Uh, and, and that should be driving everything. And I would extend that all the way through until whoever the Republican nominee is has, has physically captured enough delegates to be the official nominee. So I would extend, I would extend the nomination process as long as possible and try to create an implicit, not explicit contrast out of the White House uh, with how they're not crazy. Um, anyway, so, that, so to me, that's much more straightforward um, uh, in terms of what to do. Um, on the Republican side, 
Let me just ask on the Democratic side for a second. Was I crazy a year ago to, uh, and I may well have been because most of my Democratic friends thought I was, that to say that I thought the Democrats could be better off with a generational transition, with Biden being a successful one-term president, George, you know, George Washington, Cincinnati's thing, I've done what I came here to do, restore, save democracy, restored the country, you know, got us out of the pandemic, okay, we're running a competent foreign policy. I'm stepping aside, there'll be a vigorous primary, but, you know, we, we can... For a strong country, we we want to have a vigorous primary, a real debate among the next generation, blah, blah, blah. Was that, I was for that, I guess. I said I was at least open to it. Uh, the White House wasn't happy, and I got the same phone calls that probably people like you used to make in 1995, telling people not to even speculate about a challenge to Clinton and so forth. Was that, am I wrong that that might have worked, or was it just too risky and you just need to run the incumbent? Well, I mean, if any of you are sports fans and you have a team that's not winning a lot, uh, there's always the question as you sit there, do we make extreme measures of change for the long term or do we take the short term and try to figure out how to get through it? What is the path? The, the, if you look in sports, the, 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 the teams that are least successful are the ones that try to do both. So as Yogi Bear would say, when you get to a fork in the road, take it. So I actually think you're right and the Biden White House is right. What do I mean by that? I think in the short term, staying the course is a better path. I think in the long term, the party's probably better off taking their medicine now. Um, you know, but not if Trump, not if it makes Trump president. So in that respect, I agree with the Biden yeah. people, I guess. All yeah, right. But the, um, well, I mean, look, if Trump is the nominee. Well, so let's get the, to the Republicans. You were about well, to talk just about really them. Quick, yeah. the, the most successful candidates right now in this environment is to run someone who's beige uh, for any office, not have a strong record, not be divisive and make it a referendum on the other person. Um, and so you say, well, who can the Democrats, who can that be? Well, the answer is you have no idea uh, until you go through the process and see who can survive the process. Um uh, anyway, so you want to get the Republicans, which is much more difficult for me to. So usually, I love talking about Republicans and not Democrats. So I don't have to deal with our problems, but go ahead. So, yeah, and Biden is the beige candidate in a funny way, right? If you can make it about Trump and not pay the price for 70% wrong track and stuff, which maybe in this era you don't pay the price that God knows George H.W. Bush did pay, let's say, for that. Um, Maybe Biden ends up being a perfectly good candidate and just replicates 2020, basically. What makes me nervous is that could he replicate 2016? That is, if people want change, as you said, and they want to, and they, they, they kind of forgot how bad Trump was, and they remind themselves about that Biden's older and so forth. If Biden becomes a little more of a, and this possible no labels kind of third party activity, could we have a 2016 election instead of a 2020 election? That's kind of what makes me nervous, nervous about as a, someone who would prefer Trump not become president again. That makes me nervous about the 2024. But. Well, I'd say two things that are completely conflicting. One is Trump put out a video about two or three weeks ago, which was really a referendum on his presidency versus Biden's. And he was using all kinds of economic numbers and other things. Uh, it was a pretty compelling you can see the contours of a pretty, pretty damn compelling uh, narrative that Trump could put out on the choice for the American public. But the other issue, and I alluded to it earlier, is, you know, if you tell me, again, I like to oversimplify, there are only three things I care about in a campaign. I care about defining what this campaign's about. I care about defining my candidate. And I care about defining the opposition. Those are the only things I care about. If what defined the 2022 campaign was we're voting against crazy, if that's if that's going to be the driver on defining what this campaign's about in 2024, the Democrats are going to win. I don't care. I don't think it matters who they nominate. But it's obviously far from clear whether or not you know if it's Trump. If his ad from three weeks ago, that defines the campaign, that's going to be a difficult campaign for Democrats. If it's about crazy in our democracy, uh, then Democrats are going to win. And what do you think is more likely? Crazy. The latter. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Too much. Too much craziness there. Entirely walk. And the indictments, just final, final question, matter much? Don't matter much? Make it 
make Trump look a little more unacceptable to some swing voters? Or I think matter much. Uh, I think it matters much the primary, probably to Trump's benefit, and matters much in the general. I think much more uh, f- to the benefit of the Democrats, uh, particularly uh, particularly amongst. You know, if in these eight states that matter, you could get a 20 percent Republican Party defection to vote for Biden. That's enormous. And I think that, you know, and we have to remember these, these this is not a stationary kind of thing here. You know, we're, we're at the middle of June. The campaign hadn't really started yet. When you see a race, the Republican race for president and you see the positions of these guys, I mean, DeSantis is running to the right of Trump. Well, this, Trump is really not right or left. He's just Trump. But but if you look at all the tra- crazy Trump stuff, all the people that are going to defend him, all the stuff that they're saying to defend him, which makes no sense, uh, a race to the right on the rest of the field, it's going to make it, I think, you know, I think it's going to increase the probability uh, that crazy is going to de- is going to drive the 2024 election. Very interesting. That's really a, uh, a good way of putting it, I think, and not not quite the conventional way of putting it, but uh, uh, but a very helpful way of putting it. So anything, final words, Doug, anything we didn't cover, we should cover for people to try to understand both what's been happening for the last three, four decades and where we are now? Uh, I don't, although I'll just reinforce what I said earlier. I think particularly if you're younger, I, I think that you're living through an incredibly historic period of time that uh, when you when you're our age and look back at it, you're gonna probably even appreciate more then than you do now uh, how historic this moment of history is. Uh, and, and so I just would say to you um, uh, to reinforce to you how high these stakes are right now in, in, in our elections. No, I think that's well said, Doug Sosnick. Thank you for joining me for this very I found very interesting and stimulating conversation today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us on Conversations.